let's look at outbound channels. And these are particularly important when you want to even start the interviewing process. And so many times when I when I bring when I talk about go and interview people, one question that comes to mind is well, how many people do I really do, do I really need to talk to? And so there, I tell people that it's not really a hard number, but at the same time, the number of interviewing that you that you do kind of has diminishing returns. After a while, all the answers start sounding very similar. If you present the same, if you're if you're methodical and are presenting the same information, you are presenting the problems in the same way, and showing the same potential solutions. After a while, a lot of the answers begin to run e into each other, and you can actually predict what the next uh, response is going to be based on some very simple qualifying questions. And so I, was, I reached a point where I could tell based on how many kids uh, a person had and what the ages of the, kids, of, of the kids were, what kind of responses I was going to get. So you have to kind of eventually get to that point. And so from a, from a rough ballpark estimate, I would say that for, for the problem interview piece, generally it's, it's at a minimum of 10. So if you were in a situation where you had a very good problem understanding, um, you, maybe you're scratching your own itch, maybe you had a lot of industry experience and you understood these, these problems very well, you might be okay with just talking to 10 people and, and confirming that this is a, these are viable, valuable problems for these customers. <clears throat> but in, in other situations, you have to be prepared to talk to up to 30 or 40 people if you're doing these broad sweeps and trying to understand um, how customers really like, think and, and how they really solve these problems. So it, it kind of varies in that range. Um, but, so, but, but how do you get started? So I would say that so if, so if, if you look at the numbers of like 10 to even 30, those aren't unachievable numbers. They're actually quite easy to achieve just using your, your own one degree network. So if you're looking for parents, like in our case, I'll show you some examples we used. But we had recently become parents. We had friends. We had kids in daycare. Those were all viable outbound channels for us to go out there and use something that was common between us, you know, having a new baby in the family and the fact that we were the same school or we were, we were friends to be able to have that conversation. And so those are the ways that you get started. Um, the kind of to, to follow on to that, so one thing that I would caution is that if you, if you do use close friends and family, sometimes you have to be wary of the kind of feedback you get. So depending on what they feel about your idea, or not necessarily your idea, but your choice of profession, um, if they feel that entrepreneurship is a good thing, they might encourage you on and say yes and give you more rosy answers. And if they think it's a bad thing, they might convince you. They might tell you it's a bad idea and keep your day job or keep your regular job. So you have to be a little wary of that. So that's why for that reason, I do tell people to you know, start anywhere, even if you start with your spouse or your close best friend, whatever. But try to use them to get one or two degrees out uh, through referrals. Ask them for other people that, in this case, might have kids. But in whatever your domain, try to go one or two degrees out. Because that's when the learning becomes a little bit more neutral and probably more objective. So you, you want to do that. And then I list a whole bunch of other things here. So if you do have a teaser page that you have up there, like in the book example, you might start collecting an email list from there. If you do have an existing blog that you're, you're beginning to build products for that particular audience, you may have a readership there that you can start with. And those are both examples that I use for the, for the book that I wrote. Um, other ways, of course, are LinkedIn. I've had people, so, so, so when I'm talking about LinkedIn, I'm not even talking about like referrals, which is, which is an obvious way to use LinkedIn. But I've even had people had great success with the in-message thing they have, where you just send an email to somebody. And it's a cold email. It just happens to come from LinkedIn. But again, going back to what I said early on, is that if you get to a point where you can nail a value proposition, where you can nail a compelling problem that a particular customer has with this title in LinkedIn, it's a very effective targeting tool. And this one company in particular had very huge response rates by sending these messages based on titles of, of uh, people in LinkedIn and getting responses in, you know, within a day for at least a phone call and converting them into early adopters and all of that. Uh, they were able to do it because they had, that, they had reached that point. So that can also be quite effective. And then, of course, depending on the kind of business you're building, you know, using, using some of these paid things might also, these, these are still examples of outbound, using things like AdWords and Facebook ads to be able to drive traffic to your site and, and maybe, maybe direct them to a teaser page, collect their email address, have, have, a, have a place where they, can call, where they can leave a phone number that you can call them or, or follow up with them later on. But those are all ways of trying to do that early outbound reach to find people to interview. And of course, there's the cold call and email, which you know is always there, and people shy away from that. But many times, I've had even success if you find something in common. So one of the other markets that I was pursuing at the same time was the photographer market, and I wanted to talk to all kinds of photographers here that were professional photographers in town. 
and I would just find a list of them from the directory somewhere and just send them an email saying I was a local Austin startup willing to build and I would kind of articulate a value proposition for them and many of them were just happy to have coffee with me and and actually spent like an uh, even though I asked for 20 minutes they were happy to spend hours of their time like walking me through in excruciating detail of how their their world revolved and how they would take pictures uh, at a wedding for example and go through all the steps pre-production post-production to get the final product built and so just after a handful of those interviews like 10 or 15 of those I felt like I could go and talk to the next photographer and actually tell them how they should be like doing their process if they weren't like I feel like I got a lot of best practices from from many enough folks that I could even write like a little article about that if I wanted to um, so that's kind of the, the kind of um, immersion you have to put yourself into to get to get to that problem problem understanding stage and then there are some other things you know if you do have events and you sponsor groups there there are all kinds of ways to find other people that you might be able to tap into and I'm sure there are others that I haven't listed here but they're, they're, they're kind of a, a it's not that hard to get to the 20 to 30 people to interview is the point of what I wanted to make here at the same time you have to realize that unless you are building a a direct sales business unless direct selling is one of your channels these may not end up being viable scalable business uh, channels for you and so you have to shift more into the inbound channels uh, realm which I'll talk about later now if you are doing direct selling so say you're building an enterprise product and it's a long sales cycle I find customer development kind of aligns very nicely there because everything you're doing there talking to customers building those relationships are all things that you are going to eventually turn down into a repeatable sales process that you can then hand off to salespeople you bring on. But in the case of building something like a web app or somewhere where, or something where you're not going to be direct selling, it's going to be more self-serve or automated. In those cases, all of these are great ways to get started, to, to kind of speed up the learning process, but you have to at the same time be thinking about what are those scalable channels you're going to build and start testing them preferably from day one if you can. So in here, like being able to mix, like even for the interviews, being able to mix in some of those testing would be a good idea, for example.